YouTube videos, it's amazing. Just look at these videos, they're so entertaining. <coughs> So he built the structure that he's in now. And uh, some of the movies you'll see, he's taking a twig from one side, putting it to the other, back to the first side. So he's, he's really a decorator. <laughs> and the other thing that they do is, in this case, he has blue objects all around his power. That will attract the females. So he knows that blue is her favorite color. So not only does he build the power, but now he's actually decorating it with all kinds of blue objects. Um, not all of them, I'll show you a picture right after that. Uh, but most of them, blue is, the is for most of them the favorite color and it matches their eyes actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this. This bird has spent three days building the bower and then he spends the rest of his time uh, to actually redecorating it. So here is a picture actually where there's another one who has like orange and all kinds of different colors. But if you google that, most of the pictures that you will see is going to be of blue objects. My favorite color happens to be blue, so I would go for this bird in the museum. <laughs> I think it's very pretty, and, and he has a sense of interior decoration, which is not uh, common in the, king, in the kingdom of males, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, so, so anyway, the point is this, so he spent three days now building this power, and if you look at YouTube videos, you will see that once the female approves, and they are picky, those females, but once the female approves, she will actually come in from the back side of the bower and she'll look around and he'll hop in behind her, he'll sneak up on her and it takes like a second and it's all done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> Since there are guys in the room. <laughs> but, um, you know, so here's the question. He takes three days to build the structure. Then he decorates and redecorates uh, until, you know, the female comes and she approves and then it takes him a second to be done. And the question is like, what is driving him to do that? The amount of time that he spends building this and the amount of time that he gets having pleasure um, is really in no relationship to each other. You know, I mean, it's three days versus one second, and yet he does it, and he does it every year. Now, to be fair, they are polygamous, meaning he's hoping that he'll get more than one. <laughs> but still, you know, it's not gonna make up for three days of hard work. <laughs> and so the question is, you know, like, why would anybody do this? What is driving us to do this? And the answer is the pleasure system of the brain. We so seek pleasure that we are willing to put in a lot of work in order to get a little bit of pleasure. And this is true not just for the birds, but it's also true for, for us. To so none of them fortunately got addicted, but I would be at parties with my friends and they would all smoke marijuana and, and I would be like, actually, you know, I'm fine without it. Uh, but that was my prefrontal cortex speaking. Now other people, whatever dopamine does in the nucleus accumbens, you know, basically says to the prefrontal cortex, be quiet, you know? <laughs> basically says, you know what? I mean, you're a party pooper, prefrontal cortex, go away. Um, and then, you know, you start taking drugs and if you're unlucky, you know, you could become, you could become addicted. So this is what I wanted to say about these brain areas. There's, there's another one in here, which is the hippocampus. I've taken that out. That is also, you know, that's the memory part. So basically, these, brain, these neurons in this brain area send stuff to the frontal cortex, to the nucleus accumbens, and to, uh, to the hippocampus that I've taken out. 
but that explains the various behaviors. Um, obviously, you know, all of these cells are extremely interconnected. So we are trying to ascribe certain behaviors to certain brain areas, but you have to take it with a grain of salt because everything in the brain talks to everything. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is uh, the, the substantia nigra. So this is the parallel system that's actually the movement system that goes to a very different brain area. It goes to the striatum. Um, and those are things that are just involved in the mechanics of movement. You know, uh, if you know anybody who has Parkinson's disease, the hardest part is the initiation of movement. It's basically, you know, you tell a patient who has Parkinson's disease, please walk to, to the door, and it will take a couple of seconds before the person starts walking. There's nothing wrong with their brain, with their, uh, you know, with their cognition. They, they are perfectly fine. It is just that this area here doesn't communicate so well, and it does is because you have basically lost the neurons in the substantia nigra. So now it cannot facilitate movement anymore. You know, the second thing then is when this Parkinson's patient goes to the door, they frequently cannot stop. And again, it's not because they are not smart. It's because that system is just on delay because it's not working correctly anymore. So let's talk about the neurons. So I showed you the cable. Uh, neurons in a way are like trees. They, they get information from a lot of different areas. And I actually have a neuron here right next to <laughs> um, like, like next to the switch to explain the difference. So in this neuron here, actually here we have the cell body. It's really, really small. And then we have these long processes. And so uh, information starts coming in from here. So it starts coming in from the from the leaves, from the from the twig. It starts coming into here and it does two different things. So let me just show you here as well. So obviously this is a tree and this is a neuron and this is the cell body here. This is like where things get synthesized. This is where the DNA is, the blueprints for everything that's going to be made in that cell. Um, and then the dopamine, for example, is made here and has to be brought all the way down here. So uh, information is coming into all these different areas. It's like information coming in for all these leaves, right? Uh, and it does, so it does two things when, when information comes in. The first thing it does is it sends an electrical signal similar to my cable. It sends an electrical signal all the way down here to all these different uh, roots here, right? And each one of these here now is connected to a different neuron. This is why our brain is so interconnected. Let me say this again, 80 billion neurons, 80 to 100 wow. billion neurons. Each one of them receiving information from thousands of other neurons and then transmitting information to thousands of other neurons. And that explains why it is so difficult to find causes, for example, for psychiatric disorder. Because while we can pinpoint basic mechanisms, we could never really pinpoint the ones that did. I shouldn't say never. God knows what the future is bringing, but it, it's bringing, but at this point, that's why, because you know, everything is talking to everything and there are a million different ways how things can um, be. Uh, you know, between the information that's coming in and the other side, the next neuron that's going to be activated, there's a gap in between. And the electrical signal is not going to jump that gap. It cannot jump that gap. So what is happening is there's going to be a substance released from this side. So when the electrical signal hits the bottom, it ha there are these little bubbles in there that are filled, in our case with dopamine. And when the electrical signal comes down, this bubble is going to burst into that gap. And when the bubble bursts into that gap, so I'm, I'm here now, right? When the bubble bursts into that gap, dopamine that's in the bubble is going to be released. It's going to go to the other side. And the other side now has what we call receptors. It has actually very particular proteins. And they're built in a way that if this is your receptor and this is your dopamine, when the dopamine hits the receptor, it's like a clamp and it does something. It basically changes the receptor, it pushes it over. And once it pushes it over, it's like a domino thing that's gonna happen that uh, pushes over another thing, another thing, another thing. Really think about it like as a domino. You have this domino effect that will activate now the next neuron. 
So this, and this is where, how dopamine comes in. There are other neurotransmitters. We have glutamate, we have GABA, but our interest today is dopamine. So this is why dopamine is important. It's really then signaling from the cell that's releasing dopamine to a cell that has receptors that actually then bind the dopamine for a short while and it does this thing, it flicks over and it's like, you know, it's like flicking the first domino and a lot of things are going on in the next cell that will then make that cell um, have an electric signal going to the relative to dopamine and the ones that don't couldn't care less. Does that explain it? Mm. Do you guys have any questions? I know some of you, yeah, I know some of you are neuroscientists, I'm sorry. This is probably a loaded question, but epilepsy, I'm a, is that a function of addiction or is that hereditary? And I'm sure, it's, again, it's a loaded question, but it sounds like there's a lot happening there as it relates to epilepsy. Yeah, uh, so first of all, going back, I'm not an MD, so whatever I say, forget. No. Uh, but here's the thing about epilepsy there's two things there's hereditary epilepsy because there's so many different receptors and channels that actually make the electric activity that if some of them is mutated and there's a myriad of ways what could be mutated then the cells don't respond correctly so what you might have is you might have a lot of cells firing simultaneously and basically bringing opposing information to your muscles right and that's how you have epilepsy there are drugs that can actually induce epilepsy because what you can do is, can for example take a drug, that, that, step back, the, 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 the biggest neurotransmitter, the, the, the most prevalent neurotransmitter in the brain is obviously not dopamine, it's glutamate. And so for example, what you can do is you can actually uh, get a lot of glutamate release, for example, which, you know, everything goes haywire because now there's no order anymore. Like everything releases dopamine. This is not because it's coming in from a particular side and going out a particular side, but everything gets activated simultaneously. And the same is true for the second most prevalent neurotransmitter, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is GABA. And GABA is a lot at the center of epilepsy. And GABA, those GABA neurons are really the ones that actually in hippocampus or in the cortex, for example, they actually bring order into that system. You know, there you have like one neuron that activates like 10,000 other neurons and it inhibits this actually, this, you know, and so basically when you have a neuron that inhibits a thousand other neurons, it can, it, and it doesn't inhibit all the time, it inhibits, let's go, inhibits, let's go, right? And so by doing this, it can actually make sure that if there's like just a little bit of signal, that's not going to go through because it's inhibited. But if it's a really strong signal, it can overcome that. And the GABA system, if you have a lot of GABA release, same thing, you know, you completely activate everything or inhibit everything simultaneously and, and your brain goes haywire. But you can do this with substances and you can do this with, uh, and there's a lot of genetic mutations and polymorphisms that actually contribute to neurons under various circumstances. Uh, the first thing that I want to say about this is your brain is always active. Even if you're unconscious or if you're sleeping, you have brain waves. That's why we talk sometimes about people who are on life support but brain dead. That means they don't have any brain waves. And when they don't have any brain waves, it means the brain is gone. So even under normal circumstances, your brain, your neurons, they have a baseline pacemaker activity that just keeps going. And so here's what I wanted to show you how this looks like, uh, for example, for like the dopamine neurons. You know, we can stick an electrode into a, a rat's brain, for example, and we can measure that, you know. And on the baseline, it goes like, each one of those little stars is like, you know, firing. It fires, 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 fires. What do you think happens if somebody hands you a put a potato chip. So during reward, what do you think would happen? <laughs> so you know, before the reward, it goes like fire, 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 fire. Here comes the potato chip. <laughs> and it goes. Unfortunately, that high is very short-lived, right? That's why we go for the next potato chip. <laughs> <laughs> why 
Um, I didn't. I, I could have brought in like drugs, for example. Oh, I could have brought in sex. <laughs> I could have brought in uh, like. I hope you guys don't mind me mentioning the three-letter word, but I mean it in a very medical sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how I do it, however, but that's a different question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and we, uh, one of the discussions that we need to have at the very end is like, what gets your reward system going? There are very healthy ways to get your reward system going, and we should discuss this. But I just do potato chips here, and to be perfectly honest, um, my husband, who has all this kind of like weird um, uh, dietary restrictions. He brings out the potato chips at every meal, and it makes me. And now my son, who is a teenager, brings up the potato chips, and I've given up on that. You know, I mean, there's only so much like griping you can do, and you know, and you don't want to be like the bad person. So, oh yeah, cashews. Well, if this is what gets you going, by all means. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's just, um, so, um, so, so here is again, you know, this is, so, so, oh, I actually, I hit the button a little too early. So here's an interesting thing. When you think about potato chips, right, when you expect it, guess what? Even so you don't eat it, your reward system gets going. Yeah. But then, so you, 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 you hear the potato chips back being opened, you know, or you open the brain back and you know your reward system goes like eee! what do you think happens once you, you eat the first potato chip? Son? It just pretends like nothing has happened, right? The system just, just goes like completely normal. So now you have shifted like this excitement from actually eating the potato chip to to thinking about opening the bag. Sounds like gambling. Gambling is an addiction, as you, as you know, um, f f most people think that this is an addiction. Now, I have one more, which is, mm -hmm. so, what happens if you do not get the reward? You know, so, your, your nice sibling opens up a bag of potato chips, and because you shared the last time, you're certainly hoping, you know, that, that your sibling will share with you, and guess what? If you expect the reward, your dopamine system keeps gets going. If you don't receive it, it goes completely silent. Oh. Even like the baseline activity just goes away for a little while. And this is why just living on expectations and not getting it is actually not getting you anywhere. You know, because uh, in the in the previous example, here you would have thought, oh great, all I need to do now is open a bag of potato chips and I get my reward, right? Yeah. right. But it turns out that if you do that and you don't get the reward, that your dopamine system gets completely quiet. You know, it's kind of like, ah, potato chips. Ah, oh, you know, it's like a sibling who doesn't like to share. Um, okay. Um, so, so can I... Uh, do I have another 10 minutes or so before we start the discussion? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to take a little detour and talk about just the dopaminergic system There are um, and, and Parkinson's disease. There are two brain areas that, you know, usually if you've never seen a brain and you see brain for the first time, it's mush, right? I mean, there's nothing you can see in that brain. However, there are actually in the human brain, there are two brain areas that you can see, and one of them is the substantia nigra. This is where the dopamine is coming from that's actually involved in movement. And if you were to look at the brain of a baby, there wouldn't be any black. So, so this, this, is, this is unstained, it just comes out black, you know? Uh, so when you, when you cut through the brain, you see the black brain area, right? Um, if you're, if, if you're a baby or a, a young child, it is not black yet because that black is kind of like rust. You know, over time, your dopamine actually starts to, to kind of like build these, 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 these um, deposits that, uh, that turn black. And that's okay. I mean, you know, this is probably peaking at age 40, around age 40, it's as black as it will ever get. But afterwards, it starts to actually um, decline. So the black goes away a little bit, and um, you know, and that's actually not that. That's actually not so good. In Parkinson's disease, it pretty much goes. This is the lower one. It, it completely goes away. 
much more so than in aging. And the reason why it goes away is because the neurons in your substantia nigra die. So you're losing all these neurons. And so now the connection, you know, the, the, the connection that's going from your substantia nigra to the striatum that basically initiates the movement, you know, that connection now goes down. And that's really, that's what gives you Parkinson's disease, you know? Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Uh, the dopaminergic system is one of the most adaptive system in our brain, which in this case is really good because you can lose 70 to 80% of all your neurons in the substantia nigra without having any clinical symptoms. So when we, we, not me, but you know, when patients with Parkinson's disease, when they are seen in the clinic, all the damage has already happened because at that point they have lost 80 to 90% of the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. But how does the system adapt? How can you, how can you actually lose 70% of all your neurons? And the answer is that the neurons that stay, they actually release more dopamine they sprout a little more. And then the other side, remember there's this, this synaptic cleft, the other side now brings in more receptors mm -hmm. to be more responsive to the reduction in dopamine that's coming out. And so this is how I told you, you know, one of the things that's gonna happen is the signature is going to change. The proteins that are gonna be made are going to be changed. So in this case, when you lose your dopamine, the other side, the neuron that actually responds to dopamine changes its signature and basically says we need more receptors. So we have to make more proteins, receptor proteins, and we have to push them into the membrane so that as less and less dopamine is coming in because the neurons are dying, the other side can actually work with less and less dopamine. But this is the plasticity in the brain. This is how the brain is trying to keep a balance. Now, this is when it hurts you, and this is going back to, to addiction. So generally speaking, the yellow line in the middle is basically, you know, the line that we usually toe between feeling really good and feeling bad, between hedonia and unhedonia, as we call that, right? And so normally, you know, we kind of like we cycle around that, right? If we're depressed, we actually go way into unhedonia, that's depression, you know, but generally, we, 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 we told this line between feeling good and feeling not so good, you know? What happens if we take drugs? So this is the baseline before we take drugs. Now a drug is entering the system and we go completely into hedonia. We feel really good. The brain, however, is trying to keep a balance. What does it do? It basically activates everything to make the high come down, to go back to the baseline. But as it does so, it overshoots. So what's happening next? You actually go under the baseline and you don't feel so good. But at the end, ultimately, it is trying to really find its way back to the baseline. What happens when you take the drug again? It doesn't go quite as high anymore, but it sure goes lower. And when you take it again and again and again, here's what's happening. The brain is trying to keep balance. It's trying to keep things in balance. The more you take the drug, the more it is going to try to bring like this drug high to the base level. So when you hear addicts say they're still chasing the first high, you'll never receive the first high again because your brain has changed. And not only that, as you can see now from the red line, your baseline is now way in a feeling crappy area. And the way how we think about this is at the beginning, you know, you take drugs out of impulsivity. You're like, wow, you know, that looks great. <coughs> and all my friends are doing it, I'll do it. But it gradually goes from, from, from being to an impulsivity to what we call a compulsivity. So you need to compulsively take more and more and more drugs. Um, and the reason why you do this is because now you feel so crappy when you're not on drugs that you constantly have to take drugs to come back up. And this is when you have, uh, or, or you know, when somebody has basically switched from drug taking to actually being addicted. At the second stage here, people don't take drugs to feel high again. They start taking drugs to feel normal again. 
And so this is how these, these, the, the brain that's always trying to keep things in balance, you know, trying to figure out how much dopamine do I have to release on one side? How much dopamine does the other side like to recognize, right? So the, the more receptors are put in on the other side, the more the dopamine is gonna be recognized. Now, when there's too much dopamine flooding the system, the other side is gonna take those receptors in in order to go back to what, what the brain considers balance, homeostasis. And so this is how addiction in a way happens. And this is how when some people say, you know, when you get addicted, um, you are responsible for to getting toward addiction, you know, but once you have, you are in that stage, then you have really, you know, given up uh, any control and any responsibility. But that doesn't excuse it that you started taking drugs and that you started taking drugs a lot. You know, this is like the area where where um, th th that's not excusable. So the biggest one in my world is actually social interaction. Social interaction gets your it gets a dopamine system going like you wouldn't believe social interaction is really a great healer so interesting enough is exercise we have learned you know and i'm not like a a california crystal Birkenstock <laughs> person <laughs> but that doesn't mean that i have to be blind to ways how we can help ourselves turns out yeah. exercise and i'm not talking about like going on the treadmill at 100 miles an hour for like five hours every day but but going for walks you know going for walks with friends for example that turns out be a great antidepressant and we can model that in animals we can model that in animals that we give them little exercise wheels and it's an antidepressant in in them so the question is, how do you measure depression in animals? We can actually do this in, in rats. What we do is we put rats into, um, you know, into this long plexiglass canisters and we put water in there and we put the rat in there and the rat will swim and swim and swim and eventually it will figure out it can't escape. Now we do not let the little rat drown, let me just make this clear. Um, but what the rat will do eventually what it will do is it will stop swimming and looking for an exit and all it's going to do is it's going to float you know keep its snout above the water but just floating because it has learned that there's no escape yeah. if you do this on the following day and you put the rat into the plexiglass cylinder with water what the rat will do is it will give up much quicker because it has learned on day one that once you are in that shit box <laughs> <laughs> to me by the way you know swearing in english is very educated because it's a foreign language <laughs> it is you know and also i told you guys that I, I started out in new jersey i doubled my vocabulary in new jersey the second half i can only use in new jersey <laughs> And I love yeah. these people, by the way. You know, I've never met anyone from New Jersey I didn't like. But okay. so, uh, so, so back to that. So the next day, you know, like they will swim much less because they've learned that there's no escape from that box. It's called learned helplessness. If you give the rat after the first swim, if you give them an antidepressant, it will swim as long the second time as it swam the first time. It won't swim longer. But, you know, I used like, as a molecular biologist, I was like, oh, you know, antidepressants make the rat stupid. But that's not how we interpret it. What we interpret is makes them hopeful. It makes them not have this like learned helplessness. You know, it's not gonna give up. It's gonna try again. And so this is how we measure depression. Now, if we now have an exercise wheel in the cage, which we usually do not do, uh, the, you know, it will, the rat will perform much better in these, in, in, in these uh, um, in these experiments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that exercise is antidepressant. You know, building something, having goals, all of that actually gets your reward system going. Now, we also heard, you know, like gambling. I do not recommend that. Um, you know, so there are bad things to get your reward system going. 
And, and, and frankly, ladies, between you and me, sex is actually pretty good too, you know, that keeps your reward system going as well. Um, and then, you know, basically being motivated, working towards goals, building something, all these things actually go straight into your reward system. And, and the idea of the reward system is actually to make us successful as human beings, to make us successful as a species. Unfortunately, because of modern life, uh, you know, it has gotten derailed sometimes, you know, with the potato chips mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, and um, I mean, if you look at me, I'm not in great shape. Um, so, you know, I preach, I do not necessarily, <laughs> I, I, I try, let, let me just say, I try, and that's the best we can do, right? You try. Any questions? A, a straight thought, but that's what makes them successful as comedians. So later on in life, you can make pretty good lemonade out of it, you know? <laughs> but during the school years, this is how we look at our kids, right? They have to perform. Well, I'd like to say thank you. I'm a great oh, wow. <laughs>